Good afternoon and um, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to our online webinar on industrial perspective on licensing of the Internet of Things. And today I will discuss some of the common themes across business sectors when it comes to the licensing of standardized technologies that underpin the Internet of Things. And so IoT promises so much, um, including for the thousands of, and of small and medium-sized enterprises, which the App Association represents. And many of these SMEs are developing the next generation of innovative devices that build on top of standardized technology. And when using these technologies for the first time, many of them have encountered problems they previously were unaware of. And so having discussed these issues at length over the years of our members, two themes in particular strike at the core of our members' concerns when it comes to the licensing of standardized technology. The first one is certainty, and the second one is fairness. And this is especially the case when negotiating with larger corporation with legal teams and financial resources that SMEs simply do not have. And for this reason, transparency is critical. Transparency helps small companies to make informed business decision and uh, level the playing field. So I'm pleased that today I will be joined by our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Nicholas Tum, um, who will who will summarize for us some of the main findings of the pilot project the European Commission completed late last year on the centrality checks. And this topic speaks for the larger theme of transparency, which we believe is absolutely fundamental to having a balanced and fair system for licensing of standard essential patents and the future of Internet of Things. We at the App Association, we're committed to finding a balanced solution to licensing in the IoT, one that fairly rewards investments made uh, to create the standard, but also enables SMEs to use the standards efficiently and without concerns that doing so will not create future legal headaches. And clearing the way for SMEs ultimately helps them to grow, create jobs and drive further innovation. So today's panel is therefore about discussing solution to clear some of the, uh, these roadblocks. I'll now pass the floor um, over to our moderator today, uh, Jim Beverger, who will introduce our panelists. And I'd like to thank already each of the panelists for being with us today to share their perspective. And I'm sure we'll have a fruitful discussion that can provide some pragmatic and also some constructive solutions to some of the roadblocks of licensing IoT technologies. So without further ado, I'll give the floor to Jim. Thank you, Morgan, for the opening words. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Beveridge. I will be the moderator for today's event, Industrial Perspectives in Licensing the Internet of Things. So let me start off with the running order for today's events. In a moment, we're going to hear from Dr. Tom, who will offer us some insights into the potential role of essentiality checks to inject some transparency into the standards ecosystem. Dr. Tom's keynote will be followed by a moderated panel that will discuss some of the common themes and issues of licensing in the Internet of Things. We will then open the proceedings to audience Q&A before ending at around 16.30. So let me kick off now with the keynote address. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nicholas Tom as the keynote speaker today. Dr. Tom is currently an associate at the Technical University of Berlin. Previously, he was senior fellow at the European Commission Joint Research Center, where recent activities include the pilot study for essentiality of standard essential patents in 2020, an analysis of patent assertion entities in Europe and the role of FRAND licensing for innovation. Until 2013, Nicholas was chief economist of the European Patent Office and executive secretary of the EPO Economic and Scientific Advisory Board. He's been a member of different expert groups with the European Commission, OECD and WIPO. So Nicholas, the screen is yours. So, Thank you very much, uh, Morgan. Thank you very much, Jim, for this nice introduction. Thank you also for inviting me to this event. It's a, it's a pleasure. And my task is here to, to set the, the scene. And it's, uh, I will try to do this with a short presentation here. And uh, let me see if it works. So can you see my slides now? Fantastic. Good. 
So I will speak on my own behalf, not on behalf of Technical University Berlin, and nor will I speak on behalf of the East European Commission or the European Patent Office, where I used to work in the past, clearly. So these are entirely my own uh, views. Uh, and some of it, of course, is quite objectively simply presenting some of the results that come from the work that we have been um, driving forward with the Joint Research Center by the time. So in the introduction, Morgan already mentioned, I mean, we're moving in an environment of increasing complexity with more patents, more standards, there's more players, the vertical industries become broader, there's even end users being, being included, and of course, all the technologies themselves become more complex, and that results in more SEPs, standard essential patents, so it's getting more and more complex, actually, and difficult to come to licensing agreements. So what to do about that? And the big question here is probably, and that's what we're uh, handling uh, right now, or the European Commission is looking into, so should the state become involved actually in this? And if so, how? Probably I personally would say the state should not become involved in anything as rate setting or anything alike, but there's maybe other ways to uh, become involved. And that is clearly when it comes to uh, regulating the market in the sense of transparency. So to make, to enable um, market transactions by increasing transparency in one or another way. And here is where the public concern comes in, uh, again, with many players in the field, more complex technologies. And it's not only, so licensing nowadays is not only necessarily only about an agreement between inter-parties, but it actually has also broader you know, implications. And that is probably one of the reasons why also the European Commission is becoming active in this field. And maybe essentiality testing might be a good thing um, to do. So the big the question here, and that's what I'm going to present, is to which extent essentiality testing might make sense, considering the fact that typically 50 to 75% of SEPs that are declared are not necessarily essential at the end of the day. So, and that was what the pilot study uh, for assessment of standard essential patents by the European Commission uh, was, was about. There was a commitment to carry out this study in the 2017 um, communication on standard essential patents, and the issue has been taken up again in the IP action plan, uh, November uh, 20, 2020, where indeed the commission rephrased again. So the commission will, for instance, explore the creation of an independent system of third party essentiality checks in view of improving legal certainty and reducing litigation costs. So the issue is still on the table and this is continuing. And I'm, I'm glad also to follow the ongoing activities on the side of the European Commission and much looking forward to where this is leading to. Now I've put here two studies on this slide. The one is the essentiality pilot project and then there is the side project which, which, is, which is kind of a spin-off which was actually part initially supposed to be a chapter of the study and that is a landscape study of potentially essential patents disclosed to Etsy. Uh, which is also very interesting, but I'm not going into this one here, but both reports uh, can be can be downloaded uh, easily from the web page of the European Commission. Now, what was this about? So the objective of the study was to assess the feasibility of a system that ensures better essentiality scrutiny for SEPs in order to increase transparency. And that does include the technical and cost-wise feasibility, but also the institutional feasibility so actually so who could do it if if so and these are the different bits and pieces that were included into the study so the work packages so to speak of course the literature then the existing legal cases the relevant legal cases that includes the innovatio 2013 case the unwired planet versus huawei 2017 case where only 26% of the SEPs were found to be essential tcl versus ericsson 2017 only 39% of the those SEPs were found to be essential. Typically, I mean, courts uh, do not spend so much time looking into these issues. For instance, maybe some 20 minutes, that's what we found per SEP, and that might not be you know, um, a solid basis, maybe, it's my opinion, if for coming to, to, to a decision. In any case, I mean, courts have always the last word, and but this is what was out by the time. Then the study, it does also include um, case studies and opinions from patent pools because patent pools are those who are most experienced 
on this topic and uh, essentiality tests are typically carried out with with patent pools in the context of coming to licensing agreements so there were structured interviews with the uh, 3g3p with avanci one blue uh, siswell and via licensing all of that is included in the study you can find it there then I've mentioned already the landscaping analysis, which is interesting. So what is there actually is a stock taking of what is there in terms of SEPs with Etsy. And then at the core of all of this is this what we actually call the pilot experiment. And that is, is actually doing some essentiality tests. So 205 assessments were carried out with 48 unique patterns of 48 unique standard um, documents. Uh, most of them, all of them from the 3G and 4G standards by 3GPP Etsy. We had the pleasure of working together by the time with six patent offices, and um, there were also internal people looking into this, and altogether 28 assessors were working on those tests. Then there was a, there was a stakeholder workshop as well where all these results were presented, and of course, then and finally we have the report as you can find it now. And I just wanted to highlight maybe two things. Uh, when you look into the into the report, there is also an interesting chapter on automated automated approaches to doing as a charity assessment. I'll come back to that in a second. And then also the annexes are quite interesting. So the how the experiment was actually designed that gives you some insight into how if you get to doing these tests, how actually um, that those could be carried out. And because I think that is what is now probably more on the table going to be discussed. So if so, then how this could be done. So there is already quite some <clears throat> information in the report. But then, <clears throat> so the main results, I cannot come put up all the results considering here the, the, the shortage of, of time that is and so I have to limit only to what I find the main results coming from the report. The biggest result of, or the mo most important one, of course, is that essentiality assessment is feasible both technically and institutionally. However, and there's many scenarios in the report of different, you know, constellations of who, of how, and so on, and, and in which constellation, and so on and so on. You will find all of that there's in the recommendations and also in the summary part. I picked here e the the most important ones I find. So, so with the, the first one, we recommend policymakers to pursue the development. So yes, it's possible, and please continue the discussion here. And that's what is currently going on on behalf of the Commission, I understand. Then also, we recommend to strive for a self-finding system for essentiality assessment. So the costs, of course, are very important, and that this should not be subsidized, probably. And then on the how, actually, that also the help of artificial intelligence might actually be important in with carrying out um, these tests. And we, I'll get back to that in a second. And then, of course, also who. So apparently, some players seem to be very important to be somehow included. And they were explicitly mentioned patent offices, the European patent office, um, amongst them, of course, but also um, other um, uh, private actor players, in particular, the, the patent pools, for instance, considering their experience. And I'll get back to that as well in a second. So that was so much about the pilot. I could speak an hour probably on this. And um, together with with, uh, with Ruth Peters, um, former uh, chief intellectual property officer from Philips, we, we've been um floating the the ideas of how to do this uh, a little further and this is what i wanted to present you here as well because this presentation is supposed to to provide food for thought and uh, give reason for discussion and that's what i'm going to do here so beyond what is in the pilot because this is really referring strictly to the experiment and the findings as far as you can get there we already made what we call your six point plan for a new approach to assessing set essentiality and that was published in february in the iam journal so you might have read it already by the time so essentially it's providing answers to six important questions in this respect the first one which entities are best placed to perform essentiality checks and here um, we believe that this is around um, trust on the one side and expertise on the other side. So the trust, and that was mentioned 
along the pilot project many times by all stakeholders is that this should be a public entity and most trusted here is, is actually is the patent offices. And again, six of them have already been participating in the pilot project, but then also the expertise and the expertise that is clearly with um, with patent pools for the time being. So probably both of them should somehow uh, be taking place, taking part in such an, in such a uh, system of, of checking. It's clear this must be based on claim charts on finalized on, on granted patents and on finalized um, standard um, documents and there should be something like probably of course guidelines for you know how to do this so that is probably one of the most difficult tasks if this gets into into a, a some concrete shape to so to define something like guidelines so commonalities how different entities will be able could be able to do the same thing in order to provide a, a harmonized quality assessment then what should be the legal status of the outcome of an essentiality check and here our understanding is that it's it's much like a patent grant so this is an ex, an expert opinion from a trustworthy authority because this should be somehow embedded into a legal framework but it should also include appeal and um, opposition uh, procedures for instance, a lose or pay principle, and so on. How can the cost for essentiality checks be kept at a reasonable level? And there's there's multiple uh, issues to be to be considered. I mentioned already that in any case it should not be subsidized, so that this should be self-financed. So the the fees that that are going to be paid should somehow be cost covering, and uh, this this would. And, and this would might also allow, for instance, to integrate the work that has been done already by patent pools. And you could, of course, think about not assessing all of the patents in a patent family, so one per patent per family by major market country, for instance. And then you can think about something like certification system for other patents that have similar claims, and and so on. So. Number four, who should pay for the essentiality checks? And there we had, there was most of the discussions actually around that point when I presented that pre this, this previously. And um, in principle, of course, are all parties that are benefiting, but it's simply very difficult, as you all know, when we discuss uh, licensing, friend licensing agreements, uh, you know, in with the verticals along the value chain, that this is already quite difficult. So we will would have the same kind of discussion in in this context so for the sake of simplicity we propose that actually it should be it should be the the steps holders and that's actually how it also happens within within pools but of course the who should pay is not as, sim as simple as it sounds that question because the who is uh, would also would have to be to include about how should it be paid and when should it be paid and also the how much and uh, there, there are some views. I'm not going into that in detail, but I'm fully aware that all of this would have to be would have to be clarified. I have some ideas on that, but that's also because these are this is typically what what people want to discuss then in this context. So, what incentives should be introduced for patent holders to have essentiality checks carried out? Um, so. Clearly, there should be incentives. One could think about, uh, for instance, that collecting royalties is only possible from the date of submitting a patent for essentiality. But others, you can. There's there's plenty of of, of uh, incentives you could you could think about. Then again, how should the process for setting up essentiality check be started and institutionalized? I mean, I it's my understanding that that is already happening. So that this is. is this discussion is continuing on the side of the European um, Commission, but it should also, of course, include uh, the relevant stakeholders, uh, also considering that it's not a European issue only, but this is actually a global issue, um, considering the discussion that we have on global rates and anti-suit anti injunctions that are quite hot at the, at the time being. So uh, anything that 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 will be that could be established should clearly um, also consider already something like at least the possibility of a harmonized international international um, approach. And clearly, of course, again, I mean, patent offices, EPO amongst the first of them to mention should somehow be included here. SDOs also have to play a role here clearly. And uh, and the business communities, the pools, after all, um, it will be the, the 
it the success will depend on the concrete the specific design and that is clearly a trade-off between the trust that people put into the system the price that you have to pay for it but also the quality that you might get out of the system okay and here i leave it i hope i have not taken too much time and i'm glad to answer questions um, along the panel discussion but i hope there is there's this gives reason for for discussion now thank you yeah. So Nicholas, many, many thanks for that. I, I, I like the way you covered the pilot report, the recommendations, and especially your six point plan at the end. And I'm pleased that you'll be coming back for the audience Q&A session at the very end of the, of, the, of, the, of the panel session. So I'm sure this will trigger lots of, lots of questions. So now moving on to the panel session per se. So today's panel session will be structured in three parts. In a moment, each of the speakers will be invited to give a brief opening statement. We'll then move on to a moderated question and answer discussion. And finally, as I've just referred to at the end, we'll leave time to answer a few audience questions. So a bit of housekeeping. To answer a question, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. Please do not use the chat function as your question may get lost there. Also, please post your questions at any time during the event. These will be collected and directed to the relevant speaker. And please know that any questions related to ongoing litigation will not be answered in this forum. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited now to introduce you to our virtual plan panel who will provide us with their perspective and real practical experience in dealing with the issues of set licensing. The focus of the discussion today stems from the burgeoning demand for connected IoT devices. Now, as you know, lots of forecasts exist for the number of IoT connected devices. The most recent one I picked up was from Statista and that forecasted some 38.6 billion devices by 2025 and some 50 billion by 2050. Now to enable all these devices to connect to one another in an Internet of Things environment, the industry developed standards that provide an interoperable baseline upon which further innovation occurs in a myriad of different vertical industries. Now, business leaders operating in every industry from financial services to energy, mining, are realizing the critical importance of IoT within their organizations and they're acting quickly to invest in the technology. That said, how many of these businesses are aware that the industry specific devices using open standards will be connected to the internet using patented technology that requires a license? And to shine a very a light on the very real issues surrounding the licenses of SEPs, we have today's panelist sessions. And as our first panelist, I'm pleased to introduce to Evelina Kurganaite. And Evelina is the Secretary General of the Fair Standards Alliance. This is a Brussels-based organization that advocates fair licensing of standard technology and the development and rollout of IoT. Now, Evelina previously served as the Head of Policy Strategy and Legal Counsel at Samsung Electronics in Brussels. She has over 15 years of experience in the EU in competition law and public affairs, having spent seven years in private practice, including at Sidley Austin and Morrison Forrester. Evelina established and managed the European arm of Global, Global News Service, PAR, part of the Financial Times Group. And she's a founder and chair of Women At, which is a platform that connects and promotes women professionals around the globe. Evelina, over to you. Many thanks, Jim, and many thanks to the organizers for inviting me to join this conversation. And thanks to the audience for taking the time this lovely sunny afternoon to listen to us discuss standard essential patent or SCP licensing challenges. I was told that over a hundred people registered for the event and that from the outset, you seem like an audience that is well versed into the topics. So I will not spend time outlining concepts such as the France safeguard, lock in, hold up, presuming that you are very familiar with those. Let me, however, take a couple of minutes to briefly introduce the FSA to those of you who might be perhaps a bit less familiar with us. And I would like to just quickly show you a few slides for that. The Fair Standards Alliance is um, 
an association that's been around for slightly over five years. And uh, it's your typical Brussels association in that it's a nonprofit and that has been established for um, advocacy purposes. Um, what I think uh, maybe differentiate us from some other associations out there is that we are very mission driven association. Um, so I'll, I'll show you in a second the diverse membership that we, that we have, but what is common for all of them is that they are gathered under the auspices of this association to, um, for one cause really, uh, and that is to advocate fairer licensing of standard essential patents. And that's really what I do day in and day out. Um, here are, uh, here's a snapshot of, of our membership, which today is almost 50 members. So I would say we are probably one of the larger associations in town. And um, what I think is important to emphasize when we are thinking FSA is that it's a very diverse membership. So uh, if, you, if you take a look at, um, at the names on the screen, it's, it's really from across the value chain, from um, large and small component manufacturers from um, overseas, but also Europe uh, to um, flagship sectors of Europe, such as automotive sector. And um, we also have large ICT players, but also small uh, companies that, that count barely 100 people uh, as their employees. And we also have startups, uh, <laughs> excuse me, as their members, um, like, for example, Ira, which is one of our um, newer joiners that is, is, is barely three and a half years old as an organization. So we at the FSC like to think of ourselves as probably the most representative association out there um, that is dedicated to standard essential patents debates in particular. Moving on quickly um, on to the next slide. These are just some really uh, quick figures about, about our membership. And what I'd like to stress when I am at this slide is that FSA membership um, invests huge amounts in huge resources into R&D and innovation. And you know, if I'm thinking some, some of the smaller, say European, uh, European uh, semiconductor manufacturers, they, they invest as much as 30% of their revenue into, into R&D. All this is to say is that um, there are innovators out there who contribute to standards and there are innovators uh, who build on those standards and innovate uh, as well and invest in perhaps even larger portions or proportions of their businesses into in innovation. And what I like to stress as well is that I saw a comment on social media about um, in relation to this event that um, FSA is trying to, in its advocacy, is seeking to decrease royalties for uh, innovation. And I, I, I want to say that it's absolutely not true because the vast majority of our members uh, actually invest into patents themselves and contribute to standardization bodies and hold SAPs. So it would be absolutely counterintuitive for FSA membership to drive agenda that would, um, that, you know, that would sort of see as an ultimate goal, uh, unfair remuneration for innovation they have themselves invested into. So um, I'll leave it at that, just, um, really uh, a, a quick snapshot, uh, a snapshot of, um, of key figures and facts about the FSA. And I think I'll stop sharing my screen and go back to my um, notes in a second. Um, and for my intro remarks, I would like to focus on perhaps a couple of uh, themes. Whilst there are some more SAP licensing practices that are disconcerting, obviously, and may well be anti-competitive, uh, given that I have only a limited time window. Uh, for my intro remarks, I would single out a couple that I would say are most alarming. Um, and I would stress that some SAP holders have in the relatively recent past engaged in refusing SAP licenses to certain participants of the supply chain a practice that I tend to refer to as selective licensing and also using injunctions in SAP licensing disputes. 
And that's not to say that other practices, such as, for example, excessive use of NDAs or imposing royalties that are detached from the economic value of the underlying innovation covered by the patent are less important. That's really not to say that. But I guess my choice um, is driven by the most recent developments. We were very hopeful to finally get some legal certainty through the guidance of a court of justice on the legal questions related to license availability and injunctions in particular. However, amidst the imminent threat of injunctions, the litigation that prompted the reference for preliminary ruling to the court of justice has been settled, as, as many of you know, and so we are back to scratching our heads, literally, where to find the desperately needed legal certainty for businesses, large and small. My personal hopes are now with the European Commission and perhaps other competition authorities. And that's not only because I'm a competition lawyer. And while, okay, there might be some professional bias in it, it has actually more to do with the fact by, that by its very nature, the FRAM commitment is actually a competition safeguard that was created to fend against potential abuse of power that comes with holding SAPs when the rest of the industry is locked in into a given standardized technology. And also because that little bit of EU law that we do have on SCP licensing has actually been previously created by competition enforcers and most, most no notably by the European Commission's DG competition that on the one hand developed the useful guidance through its horizontal guidelines, but also through its antitrust enforcement. As you will recall, the only CGU case on SAP licensing, the Huawei versus ZTE, followed the European Commission's cases into Motorola and Samsung. And just as a reminder, DigiCom found that when SAP holders agree to license their SAPs on front terms, they do limit their ability to exclude potential licensees through injunctions. The commission held back then that it was a violation of Article 102 that prohibits dominance abuse for an SCP holder to seek an injunction against a willing licensee, therefore acknowledging that even a mere threat of injunction, given the very special nature of SCPs, can indeed lead to non-front licensing terms. By making a front promise, SCP holders expressly agree to pursue licensing, not market exclusion. In other words, SCP holders voluntarily agree to support the promulgation of a standard via licensing to all third parties, rather than seek to restrict the use of a standard by eliminating some market participants by refusing licenses to some or by injunctive remedies. And at the very least, injunctions should not be available in cases where granting them would be disproportionate, as is required under the EU IPI enforcement directive. But we're yet to see that to apply in practice in some of the most litigious jurisdictions in Europe. I'll stop now, appreciating that I might already be a bit over time for the intro remarks. I'll just say that from the FSA's perspective, the latest settlement does not solve any problems. It may mean licensing for some 3G and some 4G SCPs from one licensor to one licensee under the threat of imminent injunctive relief, but that's it. And I'm sure Michael from Continental, who will speak later, can give you a much um, better idea why this, is, this hasn't solved SCP licensing problems for them, or indeed anyone else in the IoT world. And I'm happy to talk about this a bit more from a broader industry's perspective later in our conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Evelina, and uh, for your intervention here. Um, so next, turning to Dr. Michael Schlo, 
who's the head of IP at Continental. Michael, um, because we're running slightly over, I'm just, I'm not gonna read out your entire very impressive CV. I think it's enough to say that Michael is head of IP, SEP at Continental, and he's been very much involved in the disputes, ongoing disputes between cellular SEP holders in Continental and other companies in the automotive industry. So Michael, over to you. Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. <clears throat> And to, to make it a little bit more concrete, what Evelina told us, I would actually give you an overview, a kind of, um, of X, let me see, can you see my screen? Uh, a kind of executive summary of what actually happened uh, in the litigation uh, between Nokia and Daimler. And uh, I would like to, say first that we had 10 cases here, 10 cases pending in front of German courts. And when you do litigation in Germany and you, you assert or you sue a company like Daimler, then usually you select the best patents you have in your portfolio because litigation in Germany is, is quite expensive. And we all know that uh, if you lose the case, uh, you also have to reimburse uh, the expenses of, of the winning party. So for this reason, we could say that the 10 cases we see here, or the 10 patents are actually kind of champion patents from, from Nokia, the, the, the most promising uh, patents, which, which they took and selected uh, to, to uh, try to, to, to reach an agreement at the end uh, with Daimler, which at the end we call a settlement happened. Uh, the, the most a prominent one is, of course, the one from Düsseldorf, uh, 7629, which was referred to the ECJ. Unfortunately, because of the settlement or the signature under the license contract, this case is not existing anymore. Uh, and uh, uh, the chance to get uh, fundamental answers from the European, uh, from the European Court of Justice is now not existing anymore. But uh, we can also have a look on the other patents. Uh, so here, for example, we have EP199. This patent is already expired. So this is a rather old patent, more than 20 years. We also have other patents, for example, here in Mannheim, EP6629, which was uh, dismissed by the court because they found the patent uh, non-essential. So this is exactly what we already heard from uh, Nikolaus. Many of those patents are actually not standard essential. And here we have one example. We also have three other patents, examples in which uh, we uh, were able to, uh, to find state of the art and we were able to prove that the patents are actually not valid. So it's not an easy task in a German litigation to convince a judge that uh, a stay of, of, of uh, of, um, of for the reason of in invalidity is necessary. And we had here three cases. So out of these 10 cases overall, we already have five cases, which are more or less unsuccessful. This gives me some kind of indication. I mean, if, if, if five patent cases out of the Champions League here from Nokia are already somehow failing, what about the overall uh, portfolio from Nokia. I think certainly uh, in the average, we would find maybe something like 80%, maybe even more of the patents either not valid or not essential or whatsoever. But of course, we had two cases in which the courts granted an injunction. So we had uh, the one in Karlsruhe, which was on the first instance in Mannheim, here the injunction came with an extraordinary high enforcement guarantee of 7 billion euro. From my perspective, uh, a, a fair, fair amount of money because stopping the production line of Daimler means a lot, can create a lot of damage. So the 7 billion, from my perspective, absolutely appropriate. But uh, the second instance, uh, even more decided that an enforcement uh, has to be stayed because of the first instant decision was obviously flawed. So here we had another, I would say, positive outcome for Daimler. 
another injunction was issued by the Munich court, first instant, and in the second instant, we got an enforcement guarantee of about 1.6 billion, which is still a lot of money. And we did not see any, any enforcement from Nokia's side, maybe, and this is of course speculation, but maybe this amount of money was simply not affordable or Nokia was not so certain about the validity of 446. So here it's speculation, but at least we have some indications. Okay, but then, I mean, after Nokia somehow changed uh, the strategy, you might have heard that they have withdrawn uh, two patent cases, which have been actually uh, initially pending in front of the Düsseldorf court, and they withdraw them actually a few days before oral hearing and refiled them in Munich. We had some more cases now in Munich, uh, and and. The hearings, the final, oh no, no, the hearings for those cases, uh, they would have taken place now in the next months. And here Nokia somehow changed a little bit of the strategy when it comes to injunction. Uh, for these cases uh, in Munich, the first one and the Karlsruhe, they had an injunction for, or they, 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 they uh, had an injunction for the complete production of Daimler in Germany. Uh, with the two other cases, they somehow sliced the uh, request for the injunction up and tried to get just injunctions for selected car lines, for example, S-Class. The goal was for sure uh, that the injunction or the enforcement security would be lower than, uh, than such huge amounts like 1.6 billion and uh, would, be in, uh, would be affordable for, for Nokia. And I think this at the end uh, was a lot of pressure to Daimler because uh, with a lower enforcement guarantee, the likelihood of, uh, of enforcing the injunction would be increased. And of course, a stop of a production of the S-Class at the end would mean a lot of economic damage for Daimler, but also a damage in image. And here Daimler simply decided that the risk became too high and the result we already know was the settlement or let's call it Daimler signed a license agreement. So the result is that also the Düsseldorf case is now now settled and uh, the referral to the ECJ is unfortunately not existing anymore. But to understand the situation even a little bit better, you have sometimes to look into the claims of those patents. I know claims are not very sexy, but it tells you a lot. First of all, I selected one because here the claim is very easy. And when we look at the claims, number 10 is an independent claim, is a processor claim. The first, what you see is it is directed to the processor. It's not the car or something like this. It's a claim and the method claim is similar to, to, to claim 10. So it's a claim that is directed to, to the processor. That means to the chipset. And in case Daimler would infringe this patent, since the patent is uh, readable in full on the chipset, the chipset manufacturer, the T1 and the T2, all would be infringers. And what we know, at least this is our opinion, any infringer of an SCP is entitled to get a direct license. And this is actually what we want to have from, from Nokia. And this is what the ECJ actually should uh, affirm the legal principle that any infringer of an SCP is entitled to get a direct license. But when you look at the claim, you can learn more. I mean, what is claimed here is a processor for telecommunication systems. And if you read a little bit more in the characterization, then uh, the processor is configured to cause data transmission to be transmitted to be transmitted into a first cycle time while the retransmission data is transmitted in on a second cycle time and the second cycle time being shorter than the first cycle time. I have around 20 years experience in IP. I have seen many patents in my career, genius patents, fundamental patents and tiny little improvements of the technology. To be honest here, this claim belongs to the tiny little improvement group. That's okay. 
the industry is doing this. So the technology is developed by tiny little improvements. That's, that's clear. Many of those patterns are like this. But what we know from the European Commission, for example, is that the SCP holder is entitled to a reasonable compensation in relation to the value of the technology prior to its adaptation into the standard. So we actually have to look at this patent, at this claim, as it would be not an SCP, a non-SCP. And if I would be an, a patent attorney or a patent counsel for a company and Nokia would come to me and offer me this patent to be licensed, I would say, just give me a second. I will go back to my engineering team. I will discuss this with my engineering team and I will ask them to change the code because what we have here is nothing else as than, than, than software code, to change the code a little bit and to make the second cycle time at least as long as the first one or a little bit longer. Then we would be on the safe side. We would not infringe the patent anymore. That would take my engineers maybe five to 10 hours in, in, in R&D time. And we would have the so-called design around which is an absolute appropriate method in the world of non-SCPs. So this design around is an alternative for me using when I, I would like to use the technology. And this design around actually gives me a price tag for what I am willing to pay for a license fee here to Nokia in case we would make a agreement and it should be cheaper than the equivalent of 10 hours in R&D because if it would be more expensive than 10 hours in R&D I would surely take the option just to de design around and now you might understand that the, the value of this patent which is now under a license agreement with Daimler comes more from the fact that the patent was taken into the, or the subject matter was taken into the standard than from the technology as such. And maybe one more observation about this patent. So if you read into the description of the patent, you will find uh, an explanation why this claim is so, you know, valuable. What is the advantage coming, coming from this claim. And you can learn that the advantage is to save some electric energy. This is always good saving electric energy, especially if you deal with smartphones. In a smartphone, you have a tiny little accumulator and you have to save electric energy. That's for sure. And therefore this pattern maybe is useful. If you go to the automotive environment in which the TCU is coupled to a huge accumulator, so maybe take an electric car like the Mercedes EQC, then you actually have a gigantic accumulator in the car and you have no need to save some picoamps just uh, to, 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 to ensure that, that you do not need to recharge your batteries. Your, your battery in the car is so huge that you would never need this patent in the automotive environment. But as a matter of fact, now Mercedes has a license in a patent. They didn't want to have the license. They wanted to have the suppliers like Continental to take a license. And what they have is a license in a patent that they, from a technical point of view, absolutely do not need because they don't need to save electric energy, at least not in, in you know, in the amount of picograms in a car. So this is a situation which is, from our point of view, not satisfying at all. We have no answers from uh, from the court of justice or anywhere, which gives us a legal certainty. We, we have now the situation that Daimler is forced into a contract, which is, yeah, from our perspective, certainly not fair. And I think there's really the need to, to ensure that for the upcoming IoT industry, this will not be the standard. And that's actually all I have to say for the moment. So thank you for listening and back to Jim.
Yeah, thanks, thanks, Michael. That's um, that, that's that's good to hear that. And, uh, and you mentioned that uh, this is what's been going on in the automotive. So I'm pleased now that we're moving away from the automotive side, where these these things really have been the centre stage uh, towards another industry and in the green industry. So representing the green side of IoT, uh, we're pleased to invite Claire Grossman, who is the EU's affairs manager at the European Smart Metering Energy Solutions Group and Claire re represents smart energy solution providers. So Claire, without further ado, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jim, and thanks for inviting me. So I'm also going to share a presentation. So I would like to start with a few words about ESMIC. So ESMIC is a European association representing the smart energy solution providers. So our members provide products, information technology, and services for multi-commodity for the display and management of energy consumption and production um, at consumer premises. So initially, SMIG represented the smart meters manufacturers only, but this association evolved. And uh, now our members are active companies that cover the entire smart meter value chain, supporting and promoting the implementation of smart metering um, and enabled energy services and products. So these products and services uh, are enabled customized tariffs and accurate bills and a precise overview of consumption and manageable demand, making energy cleaner, more affordable and more valuable. So our industry is really at the forefront of the dual green and digital transformation, a key element of the European strategy for competitiveness. So we currently have uh, 19 members ranging from SMEs to multinational companies. So getting energy usage data from meters at residences and businesses and throughout the grid back to utility companies is a challenge concrete decades ago by innovators at smart metering companies. And these solutions were built using both wired communications modes, so power line communications, and wireless modes. So cellular chipsets and module providers who did participate in the development of the wireless communication standards, implement them in their products and then supply cellular technologies to smart meter manufacturers. But what we see now is that some cellular subholders don't give license anymore to module chipset or similar connectivity component manufacturers. So over the past few years, smart metals manufacturers um, have been approached by certain subholders to directly take licenses to the cellular SEPs. And by choosing not to license an entire um, tier of the supply chain, these SEP owners are forcing downstream innovators, including smart metal companies, to negotiate licenses for technologies that they do not directly uh, implement. So this practice is, of course, uh, disruptive for the smart energy solutions company, um, and this creates uncert uncertainty and potential financial exposure for the smart meters uh, manufacturers. So the fact that wireless communication SEP owners refuse to license component level companies that provide the wireless connectivity modules that smart meter manufacturers buy, um, this can cause unpredictable cost increases, leading to business uncertainty and can also have a negative impact um, on the competitiveness of the entire sector. Um, demanding that smart metal manufacturers take SEP licenses can have numerous undesired consequences. So this might lead to first um, higher costs in a low margin business that smart metal companies may be forced to pass on to consumers. This might also drain other resources in the business, mainly on negotiations on IP for technology smart metals companies are not well placed to understand. And here this is really an issue of legal uncertainty and lack of transparency. This can uh, also have an adverse effect on incentives to innovate with consequences on the research and development investment of component suppliers 
and this can also put European smart meter manufacturers at a disadvantage. This might be particularly true with heavy industry peers in jurisdictions where IP is less enforced. So considering the, uh, the Europeans aim to replace at least 80% of electricity meters with uh, smart meters wherever it is cost effective to do so, this might also endanger the smart meter rollouts and increase the cost uh, of the energy transition. Uh, indeed, the, this price increase might influence the national cost benefit analysis and lead to a negative uh, result. So, to, to address these concerns and avoid endangering the entire clean energy transition, um, steps in the smart metering sector should be licensed on a fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory basis. And this commitment is really intended to first ensure that such patent owners receive reasonable compensation for the patented innovations as applied to smart meters, prevent patent owners from receiving remuneration for innovation that is unrelated to their own innovative efforts, and stop patent owners from uh, refusing licenses to any company willing to negotiate and sign the front uh, license. So royalties can be paid at any uh, level in the value chain, including whether subs are actually implemented, so at the chip component, intermediary device, or end product level. However, the front-based license royalty should only be set based upon the value of the component implementing the SEPs and should not include the value of other components or technologies commonly found um, in an intermediary or end product, many of which have nothing to do with, um, with wireless connectivity. So thanks, I, I, will, I will stop here and happy to, to continue the discussion with the other panelists. Thanks, Claire. That, was, that, that was, gave us a great insight into what's happening in your, in your energy sector. Um, and moving along now, I'd like to introduce Brian Scarpelli. Now, Brian is the Senior Global Policy Council ACT of the App Association, our host for today. And Brian works out of that diverse set of legal and policy issues impacting the mobile app development companies, including IP, broadband access, competition, privacy, cybersecurity, and other, other areas. You've got a lot on your plate, Brian, so over to you. <laughs> thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks to everyone for, for being here. Um, just a, a, a few, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll try to keep my, my, uh, my remarks here, uh, opening remarks rather brief, and uh, make sure, want to make sure we get to the Q&A. Uh, but, uh, you know, the ACT, the App Association, just as, as you heard earlier from Morgan and others, um, we're, we're a not-for-profit global trade association for uh, thousands of small business innovators. Uh, and we, we advocate on a wide range of issues, uh, uh, including um, use of standardized technologies, including, uh, uh, you know, standard essential patent licensing, which by definition, <laughs> one must use a standard essential patent in order to uh, to, to properly use the standard. Um, so, sta so standardization, SEP licensing, they like it or not are, are key drivers of, of, I think the modern economy that, that, that we're trying to, to advance uh, billions of devices connected that many of which were not previously connected. In other words, the, the, the rise of the internet of things, uh, which are opening new avenues of growth uh, for for SMEs uh, across um, across sectors, um, I think a, a, you know we're we're passionate about this issue, and our members push us to be at, be strong advocates on these issues um, because uh, SEP abuses uh, represent, I think, a demonstrable roadblock to the uptake of new technologies, um, and uh, and and so we uh, you know we we are strong advocates before the European Commission and other governments, but. But believe that it's fundamental that that Europe align its its frameworks and guidances to uh, 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 with respect to SEP licensing to advance its own industrial strategy goals. Um, uh, we're you know I, I would just give one one quick plug I think for I, what, what would be a helpful resource for anyone out there who's not aware of it. Um, we've. Uh, uh, we, we've we've worked with um, uh, co-founded with another organization represented on this panel, the Fair Standards Alliance, uh, 
the development of detailed SEP licensing uh, best practices through the construct of uh, SEN Senelec, the um, uh, European Standardization uh, Development Organization, uh, which provides, I think, a lot more detail and insight into these issues and, and happy to share that with anyone. But uh, you can also, I think, rather easily find it out there if you'd like to uh, to see some more detail there. Um, so just, uh, you know, some that, that's a little bit about who we are and things like that. Just substantively, I, th I thought, you know, it, in the in with the theme of this panel, I'd touch on a few a few areas that are that are most important within the standardization and SEP licensing policy and legal discussions that continue to swirl um, uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere around the globe. Um, some areas that we're particularly focused on, um, I think, probably first I'd name is transparency, which is which is um, a key key theme that everyone has touched on, but also. Um, uh, I think Nicholas in his opening remarks and, and essentiality checks did touch on this and um, and I think that that that's that's an appropriate area of focus um, and transparency can happen on numerous levels, I think, in the licensing process, starting from availability of information such as previous licensing agreements and awareness of the characteristics of patent portfolios at issue. Uh, those are critical and, and companies need to have access to that information in order to engage in a meaningful licensing negotiation. And related to this point, I think um, some attention should be given to the use of non-disclosure agreements um, at, when NDAs um, can be overly restrictive uh, and block companies' ability to engage with their supply chain in a meaningful way to better understand claims. Uh, but, but also, uh, there's a need for transparency on on licensing, licensing rates for standards so that businesses can make informed decisions before they develop products. A lack of information uh, would create, as we've talked about here, business uncertainty, particularly for SMEs. And it's something of a non-starter when they're choosing on how to develop a product um, without prior knowledge of potential costs. Our members, small businesses, simply uh, we find are, are, are unwilling to, to potentially infringe a patent that which could then ruin their um, product development and line of business later, particularly when they often have one product line, not numerous product lines, so that they can more easily absorb these costs. Um, we don't think it's reasonable for a licensor to assert claims when it knows or believes to uh, when it knows or it believes that a a patent is no longer essential to a, to a standard to withhold information about the invalidity or non essentiality of an asserted patent to withhold information that is reasonably needed by the licensee to assess whether proposed licensing terms are franned or conditioning the licensing of an SCP on a requirement that the licensee also take a license to other patents, including those that are non-SCPs or unrelated to the, to the standard uh, uh, at issue. And so for SMEs, it's not just a legal decision, will I infringe on a patent, but it's also a business de decision, how do I develop this product, knowing that down the line, I may be on the hook for a royalty, which I have no idea what that royalty will be. Um, and it's, it's, as I mentioned, particularly important for SMEs who don't have legal resources on hand to deal with these issues. And I mean, the design around solution mentioned earlier, um, I, would, I would suggest for, for a lot of these SMEs can be, is, is increasingly not feasible for, for the smaller companies with limited resources. And again, a single product line. Um, on essentiality checks, uh, it related to transparency for certain. Um, I think that that third party essentiality checks are, are a good idea, provided that they are uh, friendly and accessible to the small business community and have the right checks and balances in place. Um, uh, but I, I, I guess I would I would I would suggest and I'm, I'm really interested in others views on this too, that essentiality checks are unlikely to solve the world's problems here for SEP licensing, in my view. Um, we can have all the transparent uh, essentiality checks that we want, but if SCP licensors, for example, continue to just simply refuse to even make licenses available to uh, willing and reasonable licensees based, so, based on an arbitrary decision about where they sit in the, in the value chain, for example, that's just going to, you know, that, then uh, we, we might have more insight into whether the patents are essential or not based on a third party assessment, but, but we'll still have... Um, have uh, significant impediments to innovation. Uh, just some other priorities I'd mentioned very quickly here. Uh, we believe that, that to ensure innovation is carried out and the true benefits of IP are extracted, that competition in the marketplace should be preserved. And 
and, and as well as the ability to license SEPs based on vol voluntary commitments on FRAN terms and, and, and that when one makes a, one volunteers to put a FRAN encumbrance on an SEP that they, 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 uh, they, they align themselves with the plain and obvious meaning of non-discriminatory, the ND and FRAND, and make licenses available to any willing licensee. Um, uh, and and uh, so that, that's just a really important point, I think, worth mentioning. It's come up a couple of times. Um, we, we're also, I think, uh, 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 have, a, have a large uh, priority. We put a lot of effort into advocating for, um, uh, as to the availability of prohibitive orders, such as injunctions, which, uh, which in our view should not be sought by an SCP holder or allowed, except in limited circumstances, essentially, where, where a prospective licen licensee is demonstrably unreasonable and unwilling, and certainly not before the SCP holder has made a FRAN license offer. Um, I think I've, I've mentioned very, very briefly tying, uh, you know, that while, while some licensees may wish to get broader licenses, the patent holder should not require a, uh, a licensee to take or, or grant licenses to, um, to invalid, unenforceable, or not infringe patents or patents that are not essential to the standard. Um, and then lastly, I, I would mention very brief, <laughs> really briefly, uh, but, but uh, no order of importance here, that the rate itself, a reasonable rate for a valid, infringed, and enforceable friend encumbered SEP should be based on, on a number of factors, but, but really comes down to that the value that it should be based on the value of the actual patented invention, apart from its inclusion in the standard or other hypothetical uses further down in the value chain, et cetera. Um, and, and, and clarity, I think, is needed on that. I think we would have gotten, I think, some pretty good guidance from the CJAU on a number of these, not all of them, but a number of them. And so, you know, I, I share the, uh, the sentiment, I think, from some of the other panelists here that uh, I, I certainly we would have enjoyed uh, or, or you know, we're really looking forward to um, to getting some answers from the CJU, but 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 certainly we'll have to. You know, the, these issues are going to continue to remain. We'll have to can keep working on them. I uh, I probably should stop right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Brian. That, that's much appreciated. So last but but certainly not least, I'd like to turn now to Suzanne Monk. Um, so welcome, Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne is a counsel in David Polk's litigation department, practicing in the Antitrust and Competition Group in. Uh, in Washington, D.C. So uh, Suzanne was chief counsel for, the, for intellectual property at the FTC from 2011 to 2020. And while at the FTC, she, she led the revision of antitrust guidelines for licensing of intellectual property in collaboration with the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. And Suzanne also worked a number of high profile investigations and led several policy initiatives into the pharmaceutical and technology sector. Suzanne, over to you. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And it's been a pleasure to hear from all our panelists so far this afternoon, um, my morning. I am not representing anyone in particular. So these are my own views. And um, I'm very pleased to share them with you. I've been asked to talk a little bit about what we can expect in the United States in the Biden administration and how we think that the administration will address a number of the very challenging, I think, SEP issues that each of you have raised already. Um, I think that one of the things that will remain consistent in the United States is the role of private actors in addressing many of the FRAND issues. So, one of the things that we've seen sort of over time in the United States is a focus on the FRAND policies themselves. What do they mean? What is the contractual ob obligation? And I think that that's a very important point to raise because it cuts across both the Trump administration and into the Biden administration where parties are being asked, what did the FRAND commitment mean? What were the uh, commitments that were being made and, and what can be expected to flow from that? And the reason I'm tying the former Trump administration to the Biden administration here is that, you know, particularly I believe from the Department of Justice in the Trump administration with AEG Delrahim, 
you saw a focus on, you know, contract law can resolve these issues, patent law can resolve these issues. It's not a role for antitrust. I don't expect that you'll see that same division going into the Biden administration. I think there will be a greater role for antitrust law to play in the United States to resolve these issues. But that being said, one of the first areas of inquiry in your antitrust analysis is what did the commitment itself mean? And then you can take a step back and say, what should the commitment have meant? And I think that that puts a continued focus on you know, all of the parties on this call, um, everybody who's active in the standard setting organizations to think about what their FRAN commitment means and how it can be interpreted should it reach an enforcement action. Because I think that this is an important point to continue to keep in the back of our minds. I know we have a very qualified audience here, but on the United States side, a lot of the intervention comes through enforcement actions. And so while I believe that we will see, you know, sort of a greater flexibility in terms of looking at enforcement actions across the channels, you're still in a situation where you have sort of two limitations. The first is for the Department of Justice to bring an action, it needs to come either under section two or section one of the Sherman Act, um, you know, possibly section seven of the Clayton Act, but that's a little bit of a totally different issue. And what we've seen in terms of the section two cases are deception or behavior before you are included in the standard. And we haven't seen that type of behavior um, for quite some time. So you're looking at the DOJ having a section two authority and a, a relatively narrow band, regardless of what you think from a policy perspective. And then you're moving to the FTC with their section five authority. Um, Either way, those are relatively limited actions across time. And the reason I'm raising that is because it comes back to my central theme of if you're going to see activity, I think, particularly coming out of the United States, across a broad swath, that's going to come from private action and advocacy um, at the SSOs to address what the FRAND commitment actually means. So um, I know we have a, a brief panel discussion now, but I just wanted to thank everyone for their time. Um, and just to wrap up, I think we will see some changes in the Biden administration, but it will still be within the limits of US antitrust law. That's great, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, that, that insight. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we, um, we have had such fulsome opening remarks from our panel this afternoon that it has, somewhat truncated amount of time we've left. So what I'm going to do as a moderator, I can, I can change things around a bit. So I'm going to mix and match some of the moderated questions along with some, some questions from the audience. Um, so I'd like to invite Nicholas to, be, to join the panel in that respect. So Nicholas, let me put you on the spot then. Uh, you've called for a new approach to SEP essentiality. If you were granted one wish to help accelerate that necessary system reform, what would that wish be? Well, thank you, Jim. <laughs> one, one, one element alone will not do it, definitely, but I've mentioned okay, already, right. there is this, says, so any, any system should be based on grant, patent, claim charts, and finalized stand, and finalized standard. I said that already, but I believe, I strongly believe that because, since that was asked from the audience as well, that anything that that will be set up will have to be a balance between a market-based approach, because indeed I strongly believe in market-based solutions. I appreciate the American approach that let the you know let let the market sort it out. Existing rules, contract law, patent law might be sufficient. So Europe takes a different stance here. So, but I think all we should always consider market forces. That is why I've been very strong also emphasizing that anything that you can learn from patent pools, because that's a market-based approach, I think should be considered and it should not be overruled. If the market can solve it out by itself, then why should the regulator intervene? 
on the one side. But again, on the other side, there is this trust element. And I think, so what I would like to see, if anything that is going to happen here, I think it should happen quick because, because the markets are moving very fast and speed is decisive with these technologies. So any regulatory approach that will come in five, 10, 15 years, I mean, you know, so <laughs> uh, that might be questionable. That's one thing. And the other thing is that clearly also listening to Suzanne, that anything that 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 is going to happen, it should look into the, you know, what what's what's going on in the rest of the world. And so it should be open to a harmonized approach and should be enable enable you know the problems that we have to solve not create additional problems that's what i want to say thank you okay thanks nicholas so the answer is whatever it is make it fast um so michael um let me let me turn to you uh you've been a pioneer of the application of communication standards in the automotive sector and as we all know that's the the first vertical in the IoT industries that, that's been subject to these issues. Now, you also mentioned that in the opening statement that nuclear versus Daimler set, settlement hasn't really fixed some of, some of the fundamental issues. Now, some might suggest that the recent settlement is a way, in a way, it justifies end product licensing. Are there any examples to show that supplier level licensing is actually possible? Yeah, from our perspective, indeed. So we have experience here. We are, of course, in negotiation uh, with, uh, with license source, SAP license source. What we see here is a much more reasonable approach. You might have heard that we uh, just signed a conversion license. So uh, that was also one of the cases. We had actually four plaintiffs here. We had Nokia, which was the most prominent one, but also Sharp. We had Conversant and IP Bridge is still pending. So the Conversant case is settled. We have a license. And uh, there are other examples too. I mean, you are way Sharp, you might remember, they, uh, they, they have a license agreement now and uh, Ublox, for example, is, is uh, from my perspective, very successful in, in, uh, in, in license agreements with SCP holders. So you can see some examples. And when we talk about the Nokias of, of, of the world, you have to keep in mind that, that Nokia is one SCP owner and, and Ericsson, Qualcomm, this is one, one group, I would say. On the other hand, we have many more. We have Asian SCP owners. Uh, we, we, we have some in, 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 in the US. So it, it's a mix. We have small, we have big ones. And, and the issues which we see here in, 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 in the clash with the automotive industry, I would say this is not representative for, for all the SCP owners. In so far, I, I have some hope that we can find solutions and uh, we go on with negotiations. And if we need to, 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 to go to court, like in Texas, uh, to find some solution, then we, we are doing this also. Yeah, so both ways, both approaches, and what is successful remains to be seen. That's great. Thanks, thanks Michael. So Evelina, let, let, me turn, let me turn to you now. So the, the FSA has the benefit of having a broad-based membership from a number of different IoT sectors. So from the perspective of yourself and the FSA, is the lack of licensing availability hindering the uptake of connectivity? And what sort of effect is this having on business to business relationships and ultimately on the consumers? Before I answer your question, I just want to very quickly uh, build on what Michael has said, which is that I think it's important to uh, keep, the, keep the past in mind. Because in the past, license, uh, SCP licenses were available to anyone in the value chain, and including um, chip, chipset manufacturers. It's, it's a relatively recent uh, change in licensing practice. So the examples that Michael mentioned, many of these are, are now actually you can only achieve that through basically going to court, which Ublox has done, for example. So I just wanted to, you know, to, to give that context. But coming back to your question, the answer, the short answer is an unconditional yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I hear from my members all too often how selective SCP licensing is affecting 4G IoT uptake in Europe and how it is increasingly harder 
for European players in particular to compete against companies that can offer indemnification or vertically integrated players from overseas. And, and by vertically integrated companies in this context, I mean businesses that have their own connectivity SCPs and offer components that read on those connectivity standards. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke to one of our semiconductor manufacturing members and they had just lost a tender for a new customer, despite being more competitive from a technological point of view. And this is not the first such instance. I, I have heard that before, unfortunately. And as Brian mentioned, in the IoT space in particular, it is characterized by small innovative businesses. And all they want is simply buy a little box and plug it in to whatever smart innovation they're working on in some garage, perhaps. And the prospect of that box, if it entails, for example, LT connectivity feature, that it can blow their entire business idea at some point in the future is just not the risk they're willing to take. So they're reluctant to innovate in the 4G IoT space as soon as they learn about potential IP challenges. And, and instead they, they rather explore other technological options or you know, perhaps make a tack in their business strategy. But even when we're talking larger market players, such as for example, the European flagship automotive sector their innovation incentives are also being affected by the current SAP licensing practices. And, and Michael has given you a good examples of that, uh, good examples of that. And, you know, for example, automotive suppliers of components enabling connectivity vehicles, such as manufacturers of TCUs that Michael has shown, their freedom of operation is directly affected if they cannot get their own SAP license on front terms. And perhaps most importantly, their incentives to innovate are adversely affected as well. And I could talk quite a bit on, on for example, that they have made rights, how restrictive they are. Um, but just conscious of time, I'll, I'll just say that our um, experience um, based on, on the broad membership that we represent is that innovation incentives, innovation generally in Europe is directly being affected by the fact that licenses are not available uh, to any willing licensee. And what does it mean for consumers? Well, obviously less innovation means less choice and less choice could also mean less attractive prices going forward. I don't think that's the prospect we want for Europe. I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, thanks, Victoria. So Suzanne, let me let me turn to yourself because you you have the advantage of having spent time at F FTC for almost a decade, and, and, and during your time, the smart phone wars really became a real battleground for SEP licensing. As a former regulator yourself, what what sort of way do governments tend to look at these issues, and how do they deal with them now as they become increasingly a geopolitical issues? I'm thinking with the the, the G7 just having taken place here in the UK and the international aspect is very much coming through. How do you, how do you, is there any way you can frame that in terms of going forward? Absolutely, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. I think that, um, you know, looking at the geopolitical issues definitely informs what the American agencies are doing and saying. So, you know, going back to Nicholas's point, I think at the very top of the program that, we wouldn't expect to see intervention in rate setting. Um, I think that's been a consistent point across both political parties in the United States where we don't wanna see a situation where the enforcers or others are setting the rates for these licenses because we are you know, ultimately looking for market solutions. But at the same time, I think you see a division, obviously, between the political parties, most clearly between the Obama administration and the Trump administration, and then we'll see what happens moving into the Biden administration in terms of the role that antitrust enforcers should play at all in addressing these issues. And Evelina, I thought you had a very good point with respect to what we're ultimately talking about here, which is how do we promote innovation? How do we promote competition? And how do we promote consumer choice. And I think those are going to be 
the fundamental issues for the American enforcers. And I think you see that geopolitically across the globe that everyone is trying to figure out how do we get the best products to the citizens of our nation. And in the United States, that's going to be from a policy perspective, you know, focusing on transparency, focusing on clarity, um, looking at, I think, with the patent office in the Biden administration, looking at some of the very thorny licensing issues that arise when you're dealing with a portfolio license. Because, you know, during my time at the FTC, I think the most complicated issue that we faced across administrations was what's the role for antitrust in looking at portfolio license issues? How do you do the valuation? How do you look at the licensing? When do those licensing practices become anti-competitive? And I think going forward, it's going to be important for the enforcers across the globe to remain in dialogue there so that we can make sure that the solutions are working for all customers because we are talking about very important and very um, globally adopted products. These are not sort of specific to Europe, specific to the US, specific to Asia. Okay. Thank you, Suzanne. So Brian, uh, finally, I'm going to turn to your good self. Um, one of the things we haven't really discussed much is the experts group report. And various proposals in the report suggest that SEP holders should provide basic information to implementers up front, priority date, claim chart, access to a list of existing licensees that are licensed under the same patent. How important for the SMEs is this information to the negotiation process and for establishing what the SEP holder is a willing licensor? Any, any comments on that? Sure, thank you. <clears throat> so I, I just think generally information provided up front is critical to a good faith negotiation process and proposals from 50 to 52 of the expert uh, numbers 50 and 252 of the expert group report are tackling a fundamental issue, the availability of information. Um, I think it's important that the information asymmetry, which I think is uh, unfortunately still does seem to to plague uh, the negotiation process generally and uh, is be reduced as much as possible um, and give the those utilizing standards, especially SMEs, the ability the, the ability to 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 access the relevant information to meaningfully assess whether an offer is friend or not and, and to respond um, appropriately. So it's it's important that the that that uh, if if information uh, important information to the to the negotiation is withheld. That this would be an in, in, an indicator of an unwilling licensor uh, uh, who's operating it, 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 contravening the the frame commitment that they have chosen to make on on the on the SEPs at issue, and that they're trying and 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 to me that would represent an exploitation of 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 that information asymmetry or disparity. Uh, uh, so. Um, uh, you know, if, if we can just reduce that, I think it would reduce litigation. Um, it would be in the spirit of uh, of having a good faith negotiation that the that the CJA EU has addressed in its Huawei decision. Um, again, I, I I do I I do want to make sure I uh, uh, point folks to um, a uh, SEP licensing best practices document that goes into some pretty good detail. Um, I think it makes makes uh, uh, you know that uh, on on transparency and, and availability of information, and um, uh, is based on um, uh, the consensus agreement, the unanimous agreement actually of a, of a a very diverse cross sectoral community of stakeholders that runs across different industries, large and small entities, um, uh, you know, and, and we're, we're continuing that. That's something of a baseline, I think. Uh, uh, for us, uh, but but I, I'd hope it'd be a baseline for the commission <laughs> and and for other regulators, uh, particularly because um, uh, it was developed using a construct provided by Senselec, a European standard setting organization that ensured transparency and accessibility for anyone to the project and things like that. Um, so while and 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 you know on essentiality checks. Um, Again, I, I, I do think that they're a great idea um, uh, when if, if we can have the right checks and balances and they can really help improve transparency and, and legal certainty for uh, for 
um, licensors and licensees for the entire ecosystem. Um, I mean, I, I'd share the concern that, that the you know that 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 the current system clearly incentivizes over declaration of SEPs and you know, and there's some statistics I think that might have been mentioned earlier, some 75% of declared SEPs are not actually essential to the standard they're declared for. Um, uh, and, and but, uh, you know, as, as this moves forward, and, and I think that there's been some interesting questions that get to the, you know, the details and feasibility of such such a, a third party essentiality check system in, in some of the Q&A too, and, and they've been addressed, but uh, uh, in some remarks from other panelists, I do again. I, I would just kind of close. Whenever I think about essentiality checks, again, I, I, I think I do want to note that that they would be very important and they would help move the ball forward. But I, I again, I, I think that there's also some other looming issues that that would mean that essentiality checks on their own are not going to solve. You know, going to provide absolute certainty for every aspect of the SEP licensing ecosystem that we need, that we all need, <laughs> all of us uh, licensors, licensees and other stakeholders impacted by SAP licensing. Um, you know, for example, you know, we can have, we could, we could double or triple the amount of transparency we have, or, you know, uh, but, uh, but if, if SAP licensors are going to simply continue to refuse to make licenses available or make claims in court cases that, for example, a patent pool is not subject to the friend encumbrance on an SAP because they're an agent of the licensor and other ludicrous claims that are uh, that are so counter to the friend concept, um, then I think SCP holdup is which which I, I know that we've all seen now at this point is not up for debate to me whether SCP holdup exists. It's it's ongoing and that, that will continue to impede innovation for for our community, certain, certainly for the small business community and for the and for any and for others. Well, Brian, thank, thanks very much for that. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that brings us to a close for, for this afternoon. Um, so I think you'll agree that we managed to shed some light, or hopefully we shed some light on the issues at stake. And I'd like to give a big thank to our speakers and panelists for providing us for such a stimulating discussion. And also I'd like to thank the organizers of the App Association. So that's Morgan and Alex and Francesco and for putting on the event. But mainly I'd like to thank the audience for their particip participation today. We managed to squeeze in a couple of questions, not enough. So on that point, I, we look forward to seeing you at our next event and hopefully we'll be able to squeeze some more of your questions in then. But many thanks for your participation and bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>